Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Professor Susan Wright, who is Chair of Arts Education at the University of Melbourne and author of Understanding Creativity in Early Childhood, Meaning Making and Children's Drawings. She's going to talk to us today about young children's meaning making and communication using simple systems and multimodal forms of expression, and also why she feels the arts deserve a preeminent place in education and culture. Hello, Susan. Welcome to the MWS podcast. Thank you, Barry. It's a pleasure. Okay, well, maybe you could begin by telling us something of your background and how you became interested in this field of work. Well, I guess I grew up in an artistic family in a very small town, and from a very young age, music and drawing were were very much valued in my family and in my home life. Um, And I guess I was disappointed because when I started early schooling, there was very little valuing of the arts. I didn't get any opportunity to to draw or make any art at all in school until I was probably about an adolescent. And music consisted of just going down to the lunchroom and singing as a group. So I didn't really get much inspiration from the arts in the schooling process um, until probably adolescence. And yet I think I feel that the arts are a very important part of life. And when I started my training, I trained to be either a secondary or primary school teacher, and I chose to be primary. And as time went on, I found that going lower and lower into the age group was probably the most important thing to do because I think that's where much of that artistic expression is very strong and also it sets foundational stages for other areas of development. Okay. And why why do you think the arts in education does struggle and has to constantly reassert itself? Well, I think at a policy level it does. I think that the arts often are the underdog, particularly when you look at the level and type of support that society gives to areas such as research funding and what is valued in terms of, say, medicine and science over areas such as the arts. But I think at a school level, um, emphasis uh, can be given to the arts, and that really much depends upon the attitudes and the values of the teachers and of the school principals or the center directors. I mean, if they think it's important, they'll support it and they'll get the backing of the teachers and, and vice versa. Um, and I think it's important because the arts tap into things like personal agency, uh, social dynamics, emotional engagement, where children and teachers and the whole school community can become quite idolized by the arts. Yeah. And in fact, there's quite a lot of research that shows that often it's because of the arts that kids get motivated to attend school and to engage with, with learning in ways that they hadn't before. And we know that when when classrooms and school communities get the importance of the arts and value the arts, they become inspirations for other groups. I mean, you only need to look at the Reggio Emilia programs in Italy, for example, Mm -hmm. how they become quite world famous and people flock to see how these programs work and how. And why do you think that is? Well, because I think that people are looking for good examples. uh, And when they can see it and touch it, they can understand it. But the reason that it's working in Reggio, I guess, is because of that. I mean, the founding director of um, the Reggio program, Mel Guzzi, really inspired the teachers to think about the, co- the cultural aspects of education and, and how, as a group, they work together to, um, to, to allow children to have identity and to express themselves and to understand the world through the simple systems of drawing and dancing and singing and other forms of what they call the 100 languages. And they foregrounded this notion that we are symbolic creatures and we don't just feature maths and reading and writing, but that it's drawing and painting and singing and you know, all the areas of all the modalities of understanding. Um, art departments often try to justify the inclusion of the arts in the curriculum by the results that they produce. But um, you suggest, maybe what you're saying here, that, that a more effective approach might be to see them as, as cultural processes. Um, Uh, Could you expand on that a little bit? Well, it's true. I think that the arts have fallen victim to trying to prove their effects on other things, such as if we give the kids arts, they're better in academic areas or civic engagement or social cohesion. Um, But if we think of art as being a cultural process, 
and bring along the, the areas such as Reggio Emilia, as I was talking about earlier, social constructivist theory, is the idea is that meaning is negotiated and it's co-constructed. So children are co-constructing understanding of themselves and the world yeah. in partnership with their peers and with their teachers uh, and through interaction and through situated learning in very specific contexts where they feel comfortable, uh, where they can ask questions, where they feel respected, uh, and they're engaged with the process. And the importance of a, of a cultural kind of approach is that artistic forms and practices then are allowed to evolve or to emerge. And kids and teachers are working with symbolic and material conditions that are not predefined. So together they kind of shape the direction of how that learning goes. Yeah. And that's the value of it, I think, is to focus on the conditions that shape the experience rather than the outcomes of that experience. And so what we do is we foreground artistic decision making, um, learning over time, and and when you can then try to focus that, focus on learning over time, you develop por portfolios, documentations of learning and action, people reflecting on that learning, taking photographs of what's taking place, uh, video recording the interactions of the children, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then reviewing this as evidence of learning with other teachers, with the kids themselves, with the wider community, with parents, and sharing this evidence with the general community. That, I think, is a culture of learning. That's really interesting. Do you, do you think the more open, holistic system of drawing allows more meaning-making to occur than, say, the more linear, rule-governed system of writing? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think art-making is a very sophisticated form of thinking because it involves symbols. Um, and a lot of people say that art and play are like the first literacies of young children because they come to know themselves in the world through making. And Vygotsky talked about how, for example, when children are engaged in such meaningful things such as art, they stand a head taller because they can show what they already know. They, they can demonstrate what their thinking is, right? Instead of that other way around where they sit and raise a hand to speak, they don't know what's in the mind of the teacher, etc. but they're in the leadership role. And by focusing on the arts instead of just the academic subjects, we're not underestimating children intellectually, but stimulating them. But coming back to your idea of the rule-governed aspects of writing, I think that drawing has rules, I suppose, in a sense, but they're more flexible. Um, be but because drawing is a pictorial language, it's kind of like child speech. Uh, the kids can draw what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And that taps into imagination, creativity, expressive meaning-making. Uh, and children can depict things uh, that they're thinking much easier than they can write it. Uh, and Vygotsky, for example, talks about uh, while drawing depicts things, writing is basically drawing disembedded language. So the systems of writing letters and numbers is really quite complex for children. Um, but if we can keep drawing and play in parallel with learning these other symbol systems, I think children would be able to do it a lot easier. Do you see the link between drawing and writing as intrinsic? Yes, I do. Uh, I think the children, I mean, like children, for example, when they, they draw a picture, they say, I'm going to draw my name at the top, right? Meaning I'm going to write my name at the top. And they'll say, no, I'm going to write this man over here. And they, and they kind of interchange the meaning of drawing and writing because they know that they're both symbols. Yeah. But they haven't quite differentiated that one is more important than the other or whatever uh, until somebody tells them so. Um, so I think they are very much related, and I think probably by allowing children to use symbolic marks, uh, they can change things very readily. They can add a hat to a, a human figure and suddenly it becomes a cowboy or something like that, or they can scribble out the sun and make it dark. So I think they realize that they can manipulate symbols in, in, a, in a way, and I think that helps them understand that writing is also a symbol system. And, and you say symbol making is the essence of being human. Why, why do you think this is so? Well, I think that um, when, we, when we think in a symbolic way, we're thinking more abstractly and a bit more metaphorically, and we, and we can make connections between things that we can easily do if we're just basically thinking in a very literal, direct kind of way. Okay, and, uh, and there's a, a big question. Why do we draw uh, and paint? 
I mean, um, if you look in the archaeological record, we've been doing it for tens of thousands of years, haven't we? I think there's just something innate in us. I, I know that there's probably no truth for this, but I mean, people need to try to communicate. And, you know, if we looked at, you know, hieroglyphics or pictographs or all of these more forms of communication, it's been there since the, uh, the dawning of time. Yeah. Is that the right word? Uh, well before the invention of the wheel, etc. I think people draw to know, to understand themselves in the world. Um, it's a vehicle for human communication um, and to express ideas and to make connections with sensory modes and emotional and embodied kind of understanding of who we are in relation to the world. Mm. Do you think we could have drawn before we actually spoke? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there's probably a connection that, that because like gesture, we can indicate where we're going or how we feel through our hands and, and through our body expression. I think people probably may have been able to project that into drawing easier than coming up with a word that says, okay, an arbitrary uh, connection that the word is boy, that is boy. Well, you just assign a name to it, yeah. whereas a picogram is a very descriptive, obviously um, meaningful way of understanding. Yeah, and I suppose if you look at um, systems like hieroglyphics, they bridge the gap between drawing and writing, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, well, we're just going to have a look at some children's drawings now that form part of your research. The, the children were asked to draw what they think the future might be like. Could you tell us a little bit about this particular bit of research and, and how it was set up and with the interlocutor, etc.? Well, um, it, it went back to a time when uh, people were thinking about trying to implement kind of a futures curriculum, uh, which has to do with, you know, kind of bringing together environmental education, social sciences, you know, spirituality, kind of more deeper meaning of, of what the future might be. And we were trying to figure out how old kids could be to be, be able to undertake such a curriculum and how young can we start with this curriculum. And I propose that perhaps maybe what we do is um, ask children to draw pictures of what they think the future might be, and then we can get an idea of what their understanding is. So it kind of turned into a school project where, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the school kind of engages what futures is, and we brought in photographs from the past to talk about time in relation to where we are now, and we talked about dinosaurs, and we talked about future space age and things like that. And Grandmothers came in and said, you know, one day, one time I used to be a little girl like you, and this is what I saw, and all that kind of stuff. So they, they were really engaged with time. And, and basically, we ended up focusing on five to eight-year-old children. And on a one-to-one, -one, they went with a trained teacher who was an interlocutor playmate, sort of, with the children, just sat with them quietly and said, draw what you think, you know, tell me what you like. And some of the children sat for 15 minutes, sometimes up to close to an hour, you know, talking about what they think it would be like. Wow. And they were in, what we were interested in looking is what the child was doing and saying and thinking and learning. And the interlocutor was there to try to enrich and extend the children's playful experiences. But the child was to take the lead rather than, rather than the interlocutor. Uh, and we focused on the purpose and the function of that meaning making and looked at concepts of what we were explaining about the future, but also the way in which it was, com it was communicated, the form of that meaning, so color and the composition and things like that also had meaning. Okay, well, but should we should we start? Let's have a look at this first one. This is this was drawn by a six-year-old girl, and that's the one with her a picnic blanket. That's right. Um, she's she's actually drawing herself as a mother in the future, and she's spreading out a picnic blanket for little girls to have a have a picnic with her. And and uh, there's a pond off to the side that's got invisible crocodiles and things like that in it. Um, and she says she's got two girls and that when, you, when she brushes her hair, it goes shiny, it's beautiful, etc. But I think what's so interesting about this one is, is that she, she kind of goes into a, almost a, a metaphysical kind of communication when she starts to talk about uh, bad people and how she protects her children from them. The ideology is to protect them from harm. And she says, when someone is being naughty and she wants to strangle someone, She's got a magic hand and it's got rings and she just punches them in the head. <laughs> and the interlocutor was quite shocked by this, you know. But uh, And then she said, and when a baddie comes, she just tells her sisters and her sister tells me. And then I've got blue eyes and stuff that comes out of my eyes and it follows them and they go away. 
talks about how she doesn't just do this to everybody, just the bad people. But I find it fascinating that she um, uses her fantasy or her imagination to protect herself and her girls. And even that in the picture, you can see a small off to the uh, left hand side. It looks like a little butterfly, but it's actually a magic. It's a magic flower. Okay. And she says that sometimes the girls fight and they get a magic flower, and they just stop fighting and they're fa and they're friends again. And the magic flowers, they never grow. They just as they are and they never die off. Okay, um, and then um, the next one is um, is by an eight eight year old boy. Is that right? The one with the uh, the aeroplane in. Oh yeah, I really like this one. Yeah. Um, he became very philosophical in this drawing, and uh, you can probably gather that it's about pollution because there's a lot of smoke and uh, nasty clouds coming from the backs of the cars, etc. And in the top left-hand corner, you can see a brown cloud, which is raining acid rain. And he talks about transportation and everybody liking to be able to get around fast and all that. But essentially, the whole story is about the fact that we're polluting the world, and he draws two parks in the background behind the car. On the left-hand side is a very healthy park with running blue water and living trees with foliage, etc. And on the right-hand side is a kind of like a parallel universe or whatever, and that park is black because the water's dried out and the, and the trees don't have any leaves and everything's dying and even that bird's dying. Mm. And he, he explains that it's really not it's not um, the, bird, the animals' fault, it's the humans, because they've been looting and polluting and taking away things that, that people have spent a long time trying to, to have. And he's very saddened by this, yeah. Yeah, and it, so he really depicts two potential worlds, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I, I mean, in a lot of cases, children do work in a level of binaries where you show good, bad, strong, weak, etc. And he's got living in healthy and polluted and dying in this case, to juxtapose what these constructs are that he's trying to communicate, which I find very sophisticated for an yeah. eight-year-old. Well, is it, yeah, there's a real ethical component to the yes. to the concepts there, yeah. Um, okay, and then let's move on to the next one. Um, this is a, is a younger child, it's a five-year-old boy, and it's a projection of himself as a, a backhoe driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of lot of um, boys at that age are particularly interested in watching movement of machines and things like that. Yeah. But what I what I like about this one is, is that he's actually um, drawn himself in the drawing. He didn't write the name Reuben. The teacher wrote it for him. Um, but you can see Reuben walking up the steps of his house and waving goodbye to the to the people supposedly watching the drawing. Yeah. Um, but he's enacted that experience by entering the drawing with his fingers. Okay. And step the treads of the of the <laughs> of the steps themselves, uh, as if he is walking up the step. But another fascinating thing about the drawing is is that he previously is experiencing drawing that backhoe, so you can see all the details on the backhoe. But in the describing of it, he puts his thumb on the paper and digs his thumb into the paper to show that he's actually digging with the machine as if he is the machine. Wow. So he very much loved this experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he sort of delves into the, into the drawing himself and becomes almost part of it. Yeah, yeah, he, he enters it as if he's experiencing it. And, and oftentimes children would do that. One, one child was talking about space age and he lifted the piece of paper and moved his hands back and forth as if things were floating in space. And the, space, the piece of paper itself became the spaceship. And then he went back and drew again, you know. So that embodied connection with the art is very strong with young kids. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then um, the fourth one, this time is an eight, eight and a half year old boy's drawing. Have you got that one? Yeah, I do. Um, basically, this is, uh, well, I find this one fascinating. I mean, the man, the little boy obviously had an imagination beyond belief, but, you know, it's, it, he's got, for example, uh, the sky and the clouds, but in between that, he's got a roof line that's multicolored and it's to protect the city and actually air condition it. Uh, they can decide when they want it to be cool or warm. Um, it's quite a complex story about uh, holograms, for example, where the people can actually turn into holograms and walk through things and, and be protected if there's a car crash, etc. They just turn into a hologram and suddenly they walk through them. Um, th there's far too much information to sort of 
described in great detail here, but essentially he's, he, his content is highly technical and includes actions and describes things that are, are not even drawn. Like, for example, in the bank, he says that there are lasers um, that, that you can't see, but, you know, um, monitor people's behavior and door slam down in case anybody's trying to steal things. <laughs> yeah, but the ideologies are all basically about physical comfort and environmental security. Um, even that car at the bottom, he's got two little bubbles and the kids sit in the back bubble and the parents sit in the front so that the kids can watch video games and scream and yell and shout but nobody can hear them. They're having a good time and the parents are having a good time in the front, you know. That car actually can fly and uh -huh. underneath the car there's a gravity booth yeah. and they, you know, decide that they, they can either fly on solar energy or petrol energy. Yeah, all, the, all these pictures seem to relate to the children experience in some way. They, they're not totally abstract, if, if you get in my drift. Oh, definitely. Um, I think, um, of course, with anything, we have to build it to some extent on experience. I mean, even imagination is based on, on our, our personal experience. But I think what I like about what the children have done is, is they, they take it and own it in their own way, and the agency allows them to put a spin on it. You know? yeah. Okay, and it, let's just move on to the last one. This, for me, is a really beautiful one. This time it's by an eight-and-a-half-year-old girl. Could you tell us a little bit about this one? Well, would it be okay if I read, actually, what she said? Oh, yeah, yeah that'd be great. Okay, because I think it really says it all, in a sense. Uh, she says, I'm drawing the grass in the garden and a rose bush. It's got some roses on it, and I'm picking flowers, and I've got some nice ferns. I'm going to draw myself when I'm big. I'm old. It's a walking stick. I'm about 59. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, and this is Brooke. She's old like me. We've been friends forever. She's got brown hair, long curly hair, blowing out everywhere, out to enjoy the world. Brooke has got a black blue, blue tracksuit. Now I'll draw my dog with a bone because it likes its bone. The dog is gold. It's a golden dog, so I'll draw it yellow. And I'm going to draw a fish pond because we keep fish. We've got some purple fish, some red fish, and a multicolored fish. And the cover on the fish pond is made out of clear glass so we can see through it to see all the fishes. And the red fish is putting its head up to say hello. We're in the country. And we've got some horses in the paddock. And my horse is called Star and Brooks is King. Winter's almost over, but there's some blue sky, and it's early in the morning. And it's colder in the mornings, I guess, so that's why I need my tracksuit. <laughs> There's a green sky. I think I have to draw some red in the clouds, so that's the sun making them bright. The sun is making the colorful sky. We didn't like the city because it was too noisy, so we moved from the city to the country, and we just wanted to go back there because that's the way our life was meant to be. We only get up early once a week, otherwise we don't get enough sleep. I'll call this peaceful morning because it's quiet in the country, and it's so beautiful in the peace and quiet. That's wonderful. <laughs> You want to put it on your wall, really, don't you? <laughs> Actually, I've had it on my wall, and, and there have been periods where I've had a number of these up on my wall, and the transcripts beside them, and people stop and read them. Yeah, yeah. I, can, like that. I can completely understand. So, um, after you've done this research, what, what conclusions did you draw from, from this bit of research? Um, well, I think the whole message that I'm trying to to bring out there, I guess, is, is that art is is very fundamental for children's understanding. And I think it's not that, I mean, a lot of times people say, oh, we'll give children art because it helps improve their learning. And in fact, you know, they might do a maths lesson or something, and they'll say, no, you can draw a picture in the corner of your worksheet or something. But my uh, argument is, is that it's, art is not about improving learning, but that it is a kind of learning, you yeah. know? And it's one of the oldest and most fundamental forms of human expression and communication. And I think it really should be the core of the curriculum, particularly for very young children, because it's about embodied experience through action. And it's a form of intelligence, really, this embodied action, that underpins all our forms of reasoning. And through drawing, like you said with that little boy who entered his drawing, walked up the steps, etc., that's an understanding that you can't really get from a lot of areas of the curriculum. So I guess my bottom line is, is that through art, that the children demonstrate foundational ways of understanding through symbols. 
and they fluid they use these symbols to express and communicate in a fundamental way that they can probably in other areas of the curriculum as easily. So I don't I don't think that art is just to thrill. I think it's it's a means for enriching learning, but it's also a distinct way of thinking and feeling and knowing. Okay. Um, in the Middle Way Society, we, we see art being helpful, not only increasing the fund of symbols that we're familiar with and gaining greater clarity and coherence with the ones we know, but perhaps most importantly, increases our tolerance of ambiguity. You seem to be saying something similar when you say that um, art defamiliarizes the understanding of ourselves and propels us to look at something in a new way. Yeah, I, I, I think that probably um, Bertolt Brecht is one of the people, but I don't know who actually said this, but I believe he did, um, has a quote that says, art is not a mirror held up to society, but a hammer with which to shape it. Oh, I like that, yeah. Isn't it? It's nice. And and I guess it basically says what you what you said is, is that art allows us to, to stand back and contemplate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what it is we're all about and why we're here and what we're doing and you know abstract issues and uh, it's not simply to depict the familiar aspects of life but to propel us to look at something in a new way yeah uh, which I think is very critical to social change yeah and I suppose we see things in context with it a lot easier don't we yes and and even decontextualize it uh, and if you take something that's familiar and put it in an unfamiliar place then suddenly you say that's not supposed to be there why not of course. Uh, yeah, and then, then you start to say, well, what are the reasons behind that? Yeah. And my last question, Susan, uh, what is your understanding of the middle way, if any, and how do you feel it might relate to what we've been talking about today? Uh, I, it seems to me, if I understand it correctly, is, is that it does kind of resonate with some of the fundamental things of what art is as well. Um, because, um, well, if I can elaborate in terms of art, you tell me if you think it resonates with what you think, but art honors the significance of symbols yeah. and the important role that symbols play in reflecting the ideologies of a community, mm -hmm. what drives us, you know. And what I think also is important is, is that art um, highlights the fluidity of time through generations, uh, where individuals are bound together, right? We, we see them as cultural processes, and it helps us understand our belief systems, and our traditions, and our institutions, and our customs, and our values, and how they've developed, and why, and and I think that what I like about art, and I think maybe what you might be saying as well, is, is that we need to reward creative engagement, uh, and art allows us to do that by communicating meaningful truths, and to communicate with an eloquence, I think, that no other media can really match. Yeah. And do you see it as an integrative practice, doing art or appreciating art? Something that helps you become more integrated as a person? Most definitely. I, I think, um, you know, people have talked about uh, when, when you engage with art, you get into kind of what some people call flow, or, you know, you lose track of time. You, 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 can, you can be there for five, six hours, and you just don't want to stop, right? Yeah. Because suddenly you go into a different kind of space. It's a... Yeah, you go almost like it's a meditation or something, yeah. Okay. Well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Uh, thank you very much for spending some time talking to me. Thank you. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.